Well, people are trying to sleep, I told him. I put your motherfucking ass off this bus, you damn tramp. You don't talk to me like that. Oh! Hello, black hole. Well, hello there, love bugs. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Today's looky looky would be our golden camellia flower. And if you are not already a part of our book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube and for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes you, can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's do something different today. I told you guys that uh, TT that would be Tony Turner, had granted us an interview, okay? That is in the works, okay? I'm sure I'm only going to release it to the paying members, okay? Um, but we did have a conversation the other day that moved me enough that I wanted to read to you guys the epilogue. And know this, in that conversation, because I think we were on the phone for about three hours, just know that in that conversation, he has already given me the answers to what some of you all have already asked. Now, let's get into it. On July 10th, 1991, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I caught my reflection in the lobby mirror as I left the hotel in Amsterdam. I winked at myself, a knowing wink, because finally I felt myself delivered from the temptation to hold on. I felt as if I'd been delivered from a cult. I had decided to quit the former temptations. Little did I know that Eddie, meanwhile, had decided to dump me. He never actually fired me. I just never heard from him again after this tour. July 1991 was the last time I ever worked with a temptation. This was the end of a short tour as tours go. It had been billed deceitfully as the reunion of The Temptations, featuring Eddie Kendrick and Dennis Edwards. We had all left the States en route for Paris late one evening in June, just days after laying David Ruffin to rest. Emotionally shaken, we had made our way by air and bus through France, Belgium, Austria, Spain, Italy, and Yugoslavia. No place was too risky for an invincible temptation, not even Yugoslavia, a country torn by civil war, and no bus trip was too arduous. Sometimes we'd be in that tour bus 18 or 24 hours straight. By the time the tour last performance ended on the museum stage in Amsterdam, I was suffering from a bad flu and felt headed for my first heart attack. Before I move forward, let me tell you about the conversation that we had, right? He was telling me about an episode that happened on this particular day, okay? And he didn't expound on it in the book, but he did to me. So he said one day there on the bus, okay? And everybody's ready to settle down and get calm and, you know, just relax for the rest of the evening because they're tired, right? This is the last event on this particular tour. Eddie is in the back in his ultimate suite, okay? I would have loved to see that suite. I wonder if it had a waterbed in it, but he in the back, okay? He by himself. He ain't got no bitch with him, but I'm like, why is you playing the music? Well, anyway... T.T. was telling me that he was playing this loud music, but he had this aura about him that people tiptoed around him, and they were somewhat not scared to talk to him, but cautious 
about approaching him. They, meaning the people who were on the tour, they had said, TT, won't you go back there and tell him, could he please turn the music down? He reluctantly did it, okay? T.T., I don't know if I would have volunteered for that mission. So T.T. goes in the back like Captain Saberho, trying to save everybody else because everybody else is too scary. Yeah. T.T. just was used to it, per the conversation that we had had the other day. Uh, Eddie, do you mind turning down the music? Pause. You motherfucking bitch. Are you crazy? This is my tour bus and my goddamn show. I had never, ever heard Eddie talk like this before to anybody. It was the middle of the night on the tour bus, and I had just asked him to lower the volume on a wild screaming Jay Hawkins tape he'd woken us all up with. Well, people are trying to sleep, I told him. I put your motherfucking ass off this bus, you damn tramp. You don't talk to me like that. Oh, why did he call you a tramp? Does he know something, D.D.? Why they call you a trip, baby? Ooh, scandalous. As a member of the former Temptation staff, I had been programmed to disregard this kind of thing. After all, Eddie was a star, a legend, and we all make excuses for legends. He'd held on long, awfully long, our living fellow original Temptation, David Ruffin and Paul William. He'd watched the self-destruction and deaths of two of his closest friends and had taken a lesson from both. The lesson was, don't get caught up in it. Setting himself apart, he'd survived despite the massive ups and downs of his career. And now he was bent on holding on, even though there was hardly anything left to hold on to now beyond the legend. Eddie thought he was the one holding it all together, just like Otis Williams was holding together his bunch of temptations. Now, hold on. Let me say this. So one of my members had asked the question, is it true that David and Eddie had a sexual relationship, right? And during our conversation, I learned where the person got that question from because I was like, where is this question coming from? Who, who would think that Eddie and David had an affair. But what I missed in the Temptation movie was that there was an innuendo that those two were in a room and when Otis knocked on the door, he would not let him in. I didn't see it as a innuendo of homosexuality, right? <clears throat> but what TT said to me was how can Otis accuse David and Eddie of the same of him and Melvin, and it's true. I'm like, wait a minute, just because David and Eddie was together all the time don't mean that there's some kind of, you know, boy play going on. I mean, wasn't you and Melvin inseparable? So to the person I asked that question, there go your answer. He's like, don't fall for the bullshit. But the one who was really keeping the situation from careening off the rails now was Dennis Edwards. When he heard Eddie's outburst on the bus that night, he got up and told me, Tony, go to your bed. Oh, I'd have been like, yes, daddy. Then he snapped up skinny little Eddie, dragged him down the aisle, and literally threw him into his suite. Get your ass in there. Stop acting like a nigga. The tour progressed and Eddie Kendrick grew nastier and nastier. Dennis became a solid buffer between Eddie and the rest of the crew. He defended the background singers when Eddie accused them of singing better behind Dennis than they sang behind him and dancing better behind Dennis than they danced behind him. I wondered if Dennis had finally come out from behind the shadow of David Ruffin and found his own strength. By the time we reached Amsterdam, Eddie wasn't talking to anyone. He was in his silent treatment mode, but we just let it go. After all, he was suffering remorse and grief, or so we guessed. Who knew? Eddie never even mentioned David during the entire tour. It was like, who was David Ruffin? We tiptoed around Eddie and forgave him for his belligerent behavior, just like we used to suffer the verbal abuse David threw at us when he was in the mood. 
They were stars, legends, and if they needed to abuse us so that they could magnify themselves and their own stardom, then we were ready and willing. After all, we wanted to work for the stars because that made us stars too. Ooh, profound. Motown had taught its stars to expect the best, and we had been taught to give them the best. To fuss over them, to idolize them, to watch their every move, and make sure that nothing happened to upset them. Even if you had just shined the temptation shoes, you tried to do it perfectly because you didn't want to end up shining the contour shoes. We became victims of abuse, but we were also participants in our star's infinite vanity. The vanity that made them legends. We let them believe in their own publicity. We let them believe they were something extra, extra special, that they were demigods and nothing could touch them and nothing bad was supposed to happen to them. And if it did, somebody was going to rescue them. We were all playing the game together without understanding how destructive it was. I thought about the old Motown family with Big Daddy, Barry Gordy, sheltering his stable from all outside influences, including outside lawyers, outside accountants, outside lovers, and controlling every move. Like Otis Williams, he said, all we had to do was show up and sing with its atmosphere of secrecy and its encouragement of dependency. Motown was almost a cult. Performers like The Temptations were programmed by the company to look good, sing well, say the right things, take what was offered, and ask no questions. They learned that success lay in loyalty to the family, and they were taught to trust and believe in the power of the company to take care of their every need and desire. They started to see that Barry Gordy was no daddy. This was no fatherly love, that the man was treated them like so many other managers and promoters and record company bosses might. When they started to see that, they found out that they were powerless to change the course of their lives because Barry Gordy controlled them. And if he wanted to punish them by keeping them on the back burner for years until their contract that they never really understood ran out, then there was nothing they could do about it. I started to understand why even years later, when they were middle-aged men with grandchildren and graying hair, David, Eddie, and Dennis blamed Motown and Barry Gordy for everything that went wrong with their lives. Victims of the cult mentality on which Gordy had bred them. They couldn't stop thinking of that fabulous nirvana that they thought he had taken away from them, but which was really Barry Gordy's dreamland all along. Now, before we close this up, I know you guys are thinking, God damn, he is hard as hell on Eddie. Well, he said while Eddie uh, was in the hospital dying, the book was read to him. Okay, somebody read Eddie this book. And he called TT and he apologized for his behavior. Sometimes you don't know yourself until you see yourself. You know, you may think in your mind that you're a uh, good person or that you got it together or you're doing what you need to do in order to get the job done when in actuality you're being cruel, you know. So I found it a beautiful closure for the two, okay? Just like also he explained to me during our conversation that, uh, that's Lulu playing, um, that he and Murray Wilson made back up before her death. So that was heartwarming to know also. But this book was a beautiful ride. It is over. I'm anxious to get to the next book. The new members, or the members, they already know what the book is. You guys will find out on Friday. Oh, and the live giveaway Q&A will be this Friday at 8 or 8.30. So make sure you tune in here on the YouTube. Hey,
If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now remember this, the same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves you, baby. Have a good one. Peace.